Welcome to adapting to the new era of social platforms in open source. <laughs> Thank you, fan club. <laughs> My name is Fatima. I'm better known as Sugar Overflow on the internet. I'm a developer evangelist at GitLab. Someone is taking a photo. I focus on DevSecOps, AI, and managing and strategizing all of our community platforms and where our community exists. Uh, I'm a longtime contributor to the Drupal project, uh, if you're familiar with that, and I really enjoy conferences like these. So if you want to chat about some of the things in this talk or other open source things, please drop by uh, the GitLab booth later. And you can find me all over the internet, including the Fediverse as Sugar Overflow. If you weren't at this morning's keynote uh, with Cory Doctorow, it was absolutely amazing, and I recommend you check out the recording when you can. He talked about a lot of things, but one of the things that I found super relevant to my talk was that this idea that the internet today is really locked down uh, by a lot of rules created by corporations for the benefits of corporations. Um, and so many of us have experienced this recently with uh, the changes that have been happening to different social media platforms and the rise of decentralized platforms. Um, with the Fediverse, we're finally able to be more in control of our privacy, our data, where we take it, uh, how we use it, decide what platform we want to be on, and then maybe move around uh, if we'd like to. So we're going to talk a little bit about those things. Um, and then social media has been undoubtedly helpful in connecting communities and spreading information, both good and bad, uh, and making communities like ours to be able to share information. So it's also become really hard to leave existing social media platforms. So over the last year, we've seen a lot of changes in the social media landscape impacting how we connect and exchange information. A lot of platforms have introduced paid membership models, which make it harder for open source communities to reach their audiences without a lot of funding. For example, Twitter's API used to be free. Uh, it was a long time resource for app developers, for researchers that were studying social media data. Um, and now the enterprise pric pricing really locks out a lot of those customers from being able to afford it. Um, changes in algorithms that decide what's relevant to a feed have also uh, affected a lot of organizations. You'll hear a lot like, you know, content isn't being looked at, uh, isn't reaching a lot of their audiences like it used to. Um, centralized platforms have also been under a lot of scrutiny about how they're handling personal data. Um, and users are becoming more and more cautious about what kinds of data they share uh, and what they want to share on the internet. Um, but some of this chaos has led to a lot of interesting opportunities along with the pandemic. Uh, for example, LinkedIn creator mode came out in 2021, so it gave some content creators access to additional tools and features. Uh, you can use hashtags on your profile, share a cover story. Um, it's like an effort to bridge more content on LinkedIn. Uh, Reddit also introduced uh, an audio feature called Reddit Talks, so you could host these audio conversations in subreddits uh, in an effort to like bring communities together. Together. They just recently deprecated it, though, because it was a big infrastructure uh, load for them. Um, Audio-based platforms were generally really popular in the pandemic. I think a lot of us were having a lot of Zoom fatigue um, and preferred to maybe not have our videos on. And so we saw invite-only Clubhouse be really popular as a social network. I myself was on there. And there were a lot of like special interest communities that didn't have a space on other platforms or maybe didn't feel safe uh, sharing the depth of content that they could uh, on Clubhouse. So that was really cool as well. I made a lot of friends on Clubhouse as well. Um, and then Discord servers became a place for more than just gamers to share content, learn, uh, hang out with each other. Uh, we also saw some organizations spin up Discords for their own communities and then host like town halls, uh, office hours, and things like that. So one of the biggest opportunities from some of the changes uh, was the normalization of the Fediverse. So the Federated, Federated Social Media has been around for more than a decade. Um, but these platforms have only recently become so popular. Um, people are thinking about moving off Twitter uh, and then exploring things like Mastodon or Diaspora. And they're now gaining more attention as alternatives because people want more control over their data and their personal privacy. Uh, this graphic comes from a blog called Axbomb, written by an author called Axbomb, and it's called The Many Branches of the Fediverse. It doesn't cover all of the platforms out there, uh, but as you can see, there are a lot of tools for a lot of different use cases. There's everything from writing books uh, to multimedia to social networking to sharing 
photos and images and videos. Um, but as you can see, a lot of these tools branch out from this like green grass layer at the bottom of the tree, which is the activity pub and more protocols. So those are like open source protocols that run, uh, that these platforms run on, which allow them to be interoperable with each other. Um, but before we dive into more about what each of these, not all of them, uh, some of these platforms do, let's talk a little bit about what federated services mean. Um, so I get really excited about talking about the Fediverse, but I realize that like not everyone understands what federated models are. Um, so you'd be surprised that we use federation in our day-to-day -day lives for things like post offices and libraries. Um, so I decided to use the example of a public library system. Um, so public libraries are a decentralized network of individual libraries. Uh, they're all connected to this larger public library system. Um, each of these branches will operate independently. So they'll have like books, resources, programs, things that they operate for their own branch, um, as well as uh, databases and access to books from across other branches. Um, similarly, federated services are decentralized. They're a network of individual services connected by a common protocol. And each service of a federated model operates kind of like the branch of a library. Uh, it operates independently. It's responsible for its own data and user base, but its services are also all connected. So you're able to take that data uh, from service to service. Um, for example, users on Mastodon can communicate with users on other federated platforms like Plurnerma or Miski, even if they themselves are hosting their data on a specific platform. Um, so like if you're a user of library B, you can also order a book from library A um, uh, or C. Uh, and so the way that libraries works is really similar to the way that some of these federated platforms work. So some benefits of federated social media models, uh, they're independent instances. Uh, they can use open protocols. The most popular one is ActivityPub, but Diaspora is another one that you might hear. Uh, the new invite-only Blue Sky Social runs on its own protocol, so they're also developing a new open source protocol. ActivityPub has been around for more than a decade, so tends to be the one that people start with. Um, this enables users across different instances to communicate and interact with each other um, and also move from platform to platform. Uh, you'll never have to leave your social graph behind. This is something we heard at the keynote this morning, like the right to exit. Um, because you own your social graph, you can take it where you go. And so you're not ever really tied into a single platform. There is a really high level of customizability. Uh, so if you live in a country where there are stricter regulations or maybe the organization or project you're a part of requires more compliance, um, you're able to set those things up, although it might get more expensive when thinking about infrastructure. And then special interest communities can operate their own federated platforms. You can have like confidential communications. You can have moderation, you know, thinking about really sensitive situations where maybe you don't even want international data transfers. Like you want your instance to live in your local region and you don't want people to be able to move that data across regions to protect the safety of your users. Uh, it's very exciting, but there are uh, still a lot of challenges associated with federated social platforms. So compared to centralized platforms that we're comfortable with, uh, the Fediverse has a much smaller user base, but hopefully growing. Um, you might not find all of your community there. Uh, you might, uh, there might be an invite only wall. Um, and so it can be really hard for open source communities to fully migrate because you, know, you're, you don't know where everyone's going. Uh, you don't know if everyone's gonna be there. Um, the other thing is discoverability can be really tricky. So finding content across a platform can look really different from what you're used to. Sometimes content is more asymmetrical. It's not always uh, based on like a timeline that we're used to. It's not always a timeline based thing. It might be harder to find other open source projects that you're interested in. Um, for example, if you're on Mastodon, you'll see that everyone overuses hashtags. Uh, and this is because hashtags are the only way to find content across other other instances. Um, setting up and maintaining these instances requires a lot of technical resources and a lot of technical knowledge. I think this has been like the biggest barrier that I have seen in setting up Mastodon instances. For example, um, this can be a barrier for communities that maybe aren't technical and don't have the expertise to set that up or fund it. <laughs> um, and then the federated nature of the Fediverse can help avoid censorship, but that also means that there's a lot of work that you have to put into moderation, setting up moderation policies. Uh, the good news is you can set that up per instance and moderate as you see fit. The bad news is you need to do all of the volunteer labor in order to go through those reports. Um, so you'll see that a lot of uh, instances may even limit the membership or have membership based on approval just to kind of limit the workload that they have to go through. 
Um, yeah, uh, so some examples of Fediverse platforms. The elephant in the room is Mastodon. <laughs> I say that because the logo for uh, Mastodon has a little elephant on it. Um, so on Mastodon, you start by selecting a home instance. I think this alone has been a really big barrier uh, to users because before you even look at anything on the platform, you have to decide where you want to live on the platform. Um, and so that has turned away quite a lot of users, even though it does get quite easy to switch from an instance to another instance. Um, content feeds are, like I said, asymmetrical. Like you'll have this local timeline of the folks that are on the same home instance as yours, which is why picking your home instance uh, becomes such a big like hurdle in the beginning. And then you'll have something called a federated timeline, which is all of the folks that you're following uh, on other platforms. Um, again, there's no centralized search indexing, so hashtags are your best friend, but also your worst enemy. Uh, it's the only way to find topics and spread ideas and look for other people. Um, it's also, Mastodon is based, uh, built on the ActivityPub protocol, if you remember the giant tree. So that means if you are on Mastodon and maybe you have your PeerTube channel uh, where you share all of your videos, you can communicate with friends across those different platforms. Uh, it's probably the most popular right now because it has a lot of user privacy built in, uh, control over data, customizable instances. Uh, during the Twitter crisis, you did feel like a lot of people just went straight to Mastodon. Um, and uh, I've heard a lot about how it feels like the internet 10 years ago because there was a lot less legal rules and limitations and it's a lot like throwing words into the void and hoping someone sees them. And so um, I think that's primarily because we're not sort of comfortable with the idea of federation yet and we're, we're still trying to understand how content lives on these platforms. Another one that I found um, that seems to be really popular, they have like 2 million users currently, um, is called Minds. Uh, they say that they're a decentralized alternative to Twitter. They're fully open source, so you can actually look at their source code. Um, according to their white paper, they uh, are focused on internet privacy, uh, internet freedom and privacy. So uh, the interesting thing about it is that users earn crypto tokens for really popular content. So if you're writing something that gets a lot of views or goes viral on Minds, you start earning crypto money for it. It. Um, they also provide you with tools to monetize your content and uh, your, your, your page is basically a channel and so you can post on it, you can blog on it, um, you can share videos on it and um, you can showcase like all of the memberships that you've joined. So it's like a different uh, architecture of information but it's pretty interesting. Um, and then another feature that they're working on but isn't quite functional yet is this build your own algorithm. Uh, it lets you decide like, I wanna see like-minded content or I wanna see stuff that like challenges my viewpoints among other things. Uh, they're currently still training their AI models. So even though this is in your settings, it doesn't actually do anything yet. Um, but it might be pretty interesting when it does. There are so many other decentralized social platforms with specific niches. Uh, PeerTube is basically a decentralized YouTube alternative. Uh, it's unique, it's free to install, open source, and decentralizes video storage. It's also built on the ActivityPub protocol, so ideally you could have a Mastodon and a PeerTube and you've replaced two of your social media platforms. It uh, does peer-to-peer -peer broadcasting, so it reduces server bandwidth, so it doesn't, it's not about like hosting everything on one big server, it's like everyone kind of hosts their own thing. Uh, Diaspora is another uh, open source uh, social networking system. They run their own protocol. It was really cool. This project has been running for 11 years as of last month. Uh, fully volunteer based has a really cool wiki where they talk about the decisions they've made. Um, I really, I really enjoyed going through that. And then Friendica is like a interoperable with all the protocols platform. I think it's a Facebook alternative, though they don't say that very clearly in their documentation anywhere. It's got a very old school feel to it, so I think that might turn away uh, some some customers. It's uh, one thing I did read about it is very lightweight to host for server administrators, so it's one of the lightest platforms uh, in terms of infrastructure and ease of use. Okay, so you've decided that you're interested in pursuing another, a new social platform. So I put together a little guide to help you think through your decision uh, and be prepared for a lot of strategy work. I never drink water and talk. Um, so the first thing you want to do is evaluate your current engagement strategies on centralized platforms. So if you're on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, consider whether your social media outreach is actually effective in meeting your goals. Um, you know, is your community engaging with your posts? Uh, if not, uh, where is your community? Because that's probably where you should go. Um, before you go down the path of, I want to be on the Fediverse, you want to make sure that your community is actually interested in being on the Fediverse with you. Um, and then once you've figured out where your community is, I would make a list of things that 
uh, can be improved, uh, uh, you know, our reach of our content, maybe we can do better posts, uh, maybe we need to, uh, you know, think about privacy, things like that. So identify some areas of improvement, list them out, and then uh, think about where you're going, and then you want to prioritize what we call owned channels. So you want to start developing things that are in your control. So things like mailing lists or forums, um, retaining control over the communication and user data. So difference between owned and rented channels. Owned channels are communication channels that you control or own. So that's like a website or an email list or a forum, uh, an email list newsletter. Um, and so with these, you have a direct line of communication to your contributor. Um, that's really rare. Like you know, on platforms that are centralized, you kind of have to hope that they'll see your information or hope that they're subscribed to your feeds. Whereas with newsletters and forums, like that is your place to talk directly to your community. Uh, rented channels, on the other hand, are third party channels like Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, even if you are on Mastodon, that's kind of a rented channel, even though you are in control of some of the settings and privacy options. Um, they're effective for reaching a larger audience. So if you're doing more outreach or you're looking to grow your community, uh, it's good to invest in rented channels. Um, but they come at the risk of like the, the platform might change its policies. Uh, you know, your users might move to another platform in the face of a crisis. Um, and then the project has a little bit of a limited control about the values of the project, but also uh, platform and also how the platform will be used and who has access to it ultimately. Uh, generally, you want to invest more in own channels. That's your guaranteed audience. Um, along with the Fediverse, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention there's a lot of existing social platforms uh, that are a great option depending on your needs. So when you're assessing your needs, you also kind of want to think about, you know, the, some of these, uh, for example, we use discourse at GitLab. It helps promote community discussions, uh, topics, replies. Admi as administrators, we can set up onboarding flows. We can set up templates for topics. Uh, we can really help guide that discussion as well as set up groups and trust levels. Um, so it gives us a lot of control over our data and customization. Uh, discourse can be self-hosted, so it can become an owned channel uh, if you host it on your own. It's also an open source platform. There's a huge community and they write a lot of plugins that can help you uh, figure out you know, if you need something custom built or if you want to send notifications. They've also been releasing a lot of new features lately, including a sidebar, which looks like Slack, and a chat function. Now, I'm not someone who wants live chat on my com community's discourse forum, um, but I do think that they're trying to meet a lot of needs of a lot of different customers. Um, and so it's a really great option for an owned channel that gives you a lot of flexibility. You may not need a whole Mastodon instance if you just need a discourse. A newsletter is another great tool for community building. It's one of the most powerful own channels you can, that you can have because it's like a one-to-one -one communication. Um, you get to have regular contact with your audience, share updates, provide content. Uh, especially with some platforms, you might get the ability to make it more personalized, you know, have A-B testing and things like that. Uh, features depend on what service you're using, um, but generally you can customize it, schedule it, have email lists. Um, the downside with newsletters is that you have to do all the recruitment and all of the writing of content. Uh, our GitLab community newsletter is a lot of work, but it gets a lot of engagement from our subscribers and a lot of our community heroes and super users do submit content as well, so that's always really exciting. Discord is another platform <laughs> for creating and engaging communities. Uh, this is more real-time chat and communication. Has a lot of features like voice channels, video calls, screen sharing, community management tools. So you can set up roles, permissions, groups, specific channels that only certain people can see. Um, it, while Discord is not fully an owned channel, it's partially rented because it is owned by a company that controls like the overall data and permissions and things, you do have a lot of customizability in your own instance. Um, we actually inherited this discourse. It's a really cool story about community. It, was created organically by our GitLab community. Um, and then one day they asked us if we wanted to take it on and it's been growing ever since. And so as someone who manages community, it's a really nice story to be like, wow, they were there and now they want us to be there with them. And this is great. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, a subreddit <laughs> on Reddit, a specialized community is called a subreddit. It's a place for building community on Reddit. You'd be surprised. They're very helpful. Um, in one place, uh, post comments, contents, and votes. Um, there's a lot of participation on Reddit and a lot of strong opinions. Um, but as moderators, you do have a lot of tools that can help you kind of moderate discussions and make sure that you know civilized discussions are happening. Um, I've also noticed that our Reddit kind of self-operates. <laughs> they, they're very helpful. They help each other. Um, 
they've built a good culture on their own as well. And then we have a lot of control over, you know, spam reports and things. They do a lot of the work for me. Like every day I'll log in and they'll have already reported all the spam and all I have to do is take care of it. And so I found that the subreddit is a great place for technical, very technical discussions and sharing of content. Again, this is not a fully owned channel uh, because Reddit does have platform policies. Uh, and if you do violate those policies, they can ban your subreddit. Uh, not that I think anyone in this room is going to violate Reddit policies, but just so you know, somewhat owned channel. So you've ass assessed your current strategies and needs, and now you're ready to select a platform. So we've gone over a few owned channels as well as some examples of Fediverse platforms. So at this stage, again, just see where your community is at. If they have a community discord, maybe you just start there, start small. Um, if not, research some of those platforms, see what your which of your needs match up to the features of those platforms. Um, keep in mind things like privacy, control, interoperability, uh, and censorship resistance, since that's the primary reason why so many people are moving off. And then step three is the hardest part, uh, can create and then continue to maintain your platform of choice. So if, you, if you've selected to go down the Fediverse route, you've got a lot of work ahead of you, creating an instance, uh, setting up cross-platform interoperability, uh, monitoring and adapting to keeping your Mastodon or PeerTube instant updated. You know, as the platform changes, you also have to do some infrastructure work. Maybe everybody migrates to your Mastodon instance and suddenly you have infrastructure costs. And so there's a lot to think about when moving to the Fediverse. There's a lot of great articles. Uh, that you can read that have been written more recently um, to help you figure that out. Uh, and then if you're moving to a federated or centralized platform, you're going to have to establish some community guidelines if you don't have them already, as well as moderation policies. I highly recommend having moderation policies and a code of conduct before you start on a new social platform. Helps to have that and train your team on understanding how to do that. The Discord Academy has a really great moderation guide that I highly recommend for folks that aren't comfortable with moderating, especially if you're moving to like real time chat like Discord, you want to make sure that your team knows how to do moderation. Um, so one of the stories that I did find that I thought would be interesting, so I've been on the Hatchydurn server since, you know, everybody moved off Twitter on Mastodon, and the instance has done a really, really great job of communicating, managing, moderating, and scaling this instance. Um, they have this really great wiki where they share announcements and blog posts about the process, so they'll be like, hey, like, we're having infrastructure issues, Here, how, here's how we're planning to scale, uh, here's the legal advice that we got, here's our collective decision. Um, the server's just been growing and growing, it started out being funded by donations that were going to the creator Chris Nova's Twitch channel. Uh, and then there's like a Kofi donation page. So there's been a lot of money that's just coming in voluntarily. Um, and then they also have a volunteer team of moderators who like work to combat spam, approve membership, keep an eye on performance. And so I think they've done like an exemplary job on how to run an instance, but also to kind of showcase a lot of what goes on behind the scenes. Um, so if you're looking for a deep dive and like trying to understand what a successful operation on Mass it on looks like. Highly recommend Hachi Durham's community docs. Uh, Ubuntu Social, Ubuntu, Ubuntu Social is another example of an open source Mastodon instance. So they're a completely community run initiative. They're not endorsed by the project or hosted by Canonical. Um, they actually limit membership. So only people with a Ubuntu email address are able to join this instance. Uh, and they did so because they had an experience where the infrastructure costs were just too much for a volunteer to maintain. And they decided like, hey, this is the best way that we can create a, an instance where our community members can have conversations, but we don't have to pay so much money out of the pocket. Um, and then the person who hosts this, Popey, did a really great interview on the last episode of the Linux Matters podcast where he goes into details about like, he ran out of disk space, tried to update the instance the first time, had to have the whole complete restall. So if you're interested in like the technical difficulties, like the caching problems and things like that, like that episode is really great to check out. So you're on this new platform, now what? Uh, well, just keep measuring, evaluating, and iterating. Just like with any new tool or service, you wanna start small, uh, share your adoption with your community, encourage your team members to join you, uh, promote it with existing channels. So if you have owned channels, start promoting the fact that you're moving over. Uh, share your plan, your reasonings, and your timelines. I think it's a good idea to tell your community what your plans are and then see what the reaction is. Um, chances are they're on, on board with it. Like I really 
love the way Hachidarm gives us announcements and lets us know what's going on. I also recommend, if you can, to involve your community members in the decision-making process uh, in platform selection through surveys or open forums. Um, I think it's important for the platform that you move to to be what your community wants to move to. <laughs> Essentially, that's a place for your community to talk to you and grow with you, and so it's good to know what their preferences are. Um, and then regularly assess your strategies. I mean, everyone has room for improvement, um, so make sure that you know things are working. Are you having user growth? Are people interacting with your content on this new platform? Are you getting feedback from community members? What is that feedback, and how can you do better? Uh, a little plug for GitLab, so we're really intentional about documenting in a manner that creates a single source of truth. We operate handbook first, so a lot of this, the platforms that we're on that I showed you today, like our discourse forum, our Discord, uh, we put all of the documentation as to how we moderate, how we set up workflows, the trust levels on our forums in our handbook. So if you scan this QR code, it'll take you directly to the community engagement section of our handbook. Uh, so you can see how we do it, and hopefully uh, if you do it differently, you can open an issue and let me know so that we can learn together. Uh, and that's all I've got. This is a QR code to the slides. I did a lot of research on the Fediverse to put this talk together, so there is an appendix full of articles uh, if you like reading. Uh, thanks so much for joining me. Questions? I don't know when this session ends. Yeah. I forgot to start the timer. <laughs> 10 more minutes. So we have 10 more minutes for questions. Thank you. No questions? Yes. Hi. Okay, so for the recording, the question is, do you get any meaningful did you technical discussions happening in the subreddit for GitLab? So, you know, someone will jump in and say, uh, I don't know how to do this, this is not working, and they'll, you know, post the error log or the code. Um, and a community member will jump in and be like, actually, you're doing this not so correctly, here's the correct way to do it. Um, occasionally we'll even get like, hey, I like read your handbook and I really like this section on culture and transparency and then people will have a whole debate about culture and transparency and being open. Um, I don't know that I've seen any like really deep dives unless it's something like trending like AI or similar uh, or a new feature. Um, that's when you really get like 300 comments uh, of a discussion. So it, really, it depends on the topic, but yes, in, like once a month usually we get something that's like very spicy. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Yes. Okay, repeating the question for the recording. On Mastodon, you're hearing that a lot of open source folks are going to the Hachiderm instance or the Fostodon instance. Uh, do I know any differences uh, between the two? No. <laughs> uh, at the time when I selected Hashiderm, I didn't know about Fostodon. A lot of the people who were in my social graph on Twitter were moving to Hachiderm, so I was like, I guess I too should move to Hachiderm. Um, and so I, I, I really looked up to Chris Nova at the time when they started the instance, and so that was my primary reason. I can follow up with you uh, if I hear uh, about Fostodon. <laughs> Thank you. Michael. Uh, so the question is, GitHub recently added forums to their platform. Is GitLab adding anything to that? Uh, as an employee of GitLab, I cannot make forward-looking statements, uh, but uh, happy to chat. Maybe there's an issue open. We can look at it together. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, great. Uh, if you do have questions or you want to talk more one-on-one, -on -one, I'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts. I will be at the GitLab booth from 2 p.m. every day until this conference ends. <laughs> Thank you so much.